Good morning. Let's get straight to markets. Take a look at the impact for the indices. Factual. Succinct. All you need to know before your trading day starts. Subscribe to our newsletter, CNBC's Daily Open. Welcome to Beyond the Valley, a CNBC tech podcast with Arjun Karpal and Tom Chitty. If you commute to work in a city, chances are you spend part of that journey on a train of some sort, travelling through a vast network of tunnels. You may be on one right now. That's because in the last hundred years, much of the infrastructure for city transport has developed underground. But the ways we get around our urban areas may soon change, with innovators looking not just above ground, but up in the sky. Beyond the valley. I'm looking forward to this episode because I don't know where we're at, where the landscape for, you're going to say the word? EV tolls. What does that mean? I don't know. I don't love it. I don't love the, I'm just generally not a fan of acronyms on the whole. Who, ca- who, who comes up with acronyms? Who's the, you know, who's responsible? Well, they just put, they put words together and then, you know, whatever letter they start with, they... Also, nightmare to type out because it's really? lowercase e for yeah. anyone that doesn't know, and then it's capital letters for everything else. Electric vertical takeoff and landing. Electric vertical, that's the V. Takeoff, T O. Landing, that's the L. That's EV toll. That's what it stands for. An EV toll aircraft. Do you want to hear a fun plane story? All right. Before we, we start <laughs> you, this you've episode. I've got a few of those. I've heard I've a few got a lot. <laughs> Do you want to hear the funnest one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I was on holiday recently, Um, I took a plane ride. It was a 12-hour plane ride. Um, And it was a plane ride from hell, is how I describe it. So, you know, we get onto the plane, um, and there's already an hour and a half delay. And uh, then the the pilot over the tannoy says, oh, we've got another 20 minutes delay. Uh, We've just found somebody vaping in the bathroom, which, of course, is illegal. Um, So plane hasn't taken off. Three people kicked off the flight. You know, I'm sat with my friends uh, and there's a large group of, of men, about 20 of them, sort of surrounding us. And they had gotten to the, the, the flight quite inebriated uh, and got progressively more inebriated. And they were sort of walking up and down the aisles. There was a fight in between their own group. Physical fight. It almost turned physical. Mm. Um, you know, they were squaring up almost. I go to the back of the plane and ask for a bottle of water and a gin and tonic. Um, that was my nightcap. Well, I mean, it was the afternoon, but I was ready for sleep so I could adjust <laughs> so, to the time zone to where like I was being, going. Yeah. <laughs> they said, no, we've shut the entire bar for the plane because of this rowdy group of, of people. Anyways, I get back to my seat. I notice this group of people had opened a duty-free bottle of alcohol. Again, something you're not supposed to do. Bag needs to remain sealed until your destination. So again, progressively more inebriated. Uh, second fight broke out. Um, I'd also learned from the flight attendant that uh, someone had lit up a cigarette in the uh, in the bathroom. Um, again, illegal. Uh, one of their group was headbutting a chair, threw up. Um, then one of his mates started a fight with one of the flight attendants. Uh, anyways, all settled down. Eventually, we landed, and the pilot announces, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna just stop here for a minute for the regular." Um, check from the local authorities, the regular check. Of course, there's a regular check. There's not. Uh, nine police. Nine arrests. Nine, well, no, nine police came on board. Oh, wow. And there were roughly 13 people taken off that flight. Um, Essentially being arrested. They were arrested, yeah. They went peacefully. Um, I mean, you would. They're probably on a ha- in a hangover mode. They were definitely <laughs> hangover mode. Um, anyways, that was the start of my vacation. Have there's anyone? I'd love to hear if it, our yeah I, listeners have had any kind of experiences like that. Maybe you were on the flight as well. And maybe you, <laughs> maybe you're listening to this and you were on that flight. If you do want to uh, tell us your trips from hell, then you can email in at beyondthevalley at cnbc dot com. And we'd love to hear them. <laughs> yeah, well, thankfully, um, these EV tolls aren't big enough to have a group of 20 people going on a bachelor party. Before we get into the main uh, topic for today, let's do Arjun's stat of the week. $35.8 billion. $35.8 billion. Okay, Arjun, we've explained the acronym EV toll stands for, but give us a little bit, a brief overview of what exactly we're talking when we say EV toll. 
So these are these are electric aircraft, um, basically, often maybe with space for two to six passengers. Um, and what the, they don't take off and land like airplanes. They, they take off and land, as the name suggests, vertically, which obviously is great for space. Um, so very similar to a helicopter, what a helicopter does, though the technology is a bit different. So no runways. Um, and that's effectively what they are. They're passenger aircraft run on electric uh, and designed, I think, for sort of within cities, but also in between cities too. Um, so we're not talking about uh, long distance, you know, 12 hour flights like I took, but it's more shorter distance uh, kind of flights, perhaps in between cities in the same country um, or, or even within a city itself. Well, why, why not call them flying cars? I call them flying cars. But, you know, the industry uh, likes to reject such populist terms, I think. Uh, <laughs> Come up with something a bit more. They are flying cars. They're flying cars. These vehicles aren't necessarily actually cars with wheels either, because I know that you've done, you've got a program coming out uh, soon yeah. about EV tolls. And there is a one car, which is actually a car that turns into... A flying car. So there really is that. There's also that concept. What one of the interesting things, as we'll talk about, and if you if you watch that episode, you'll see is there's so many different designs and concepts right now for what one of these vehicles should look like, both from a design point of view, but also from a technology point of view. What 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 kind of um, system are you using um, to to propel the aircraft? So I think you'll see some of those car designs look like cars. Maybe even in the future there'll be a sort of hybrid. You know, can drive on the road, wings come out and off it goes situation. Um, but a lot of them now are, are looking kind of like a hybrid between, you know, a drone, as you know it, you know, one of those remote control drones, but on a much larger scale, crossed with a kind of, you know, an aircraft. There's four, I mean, there's hundreds there's, of yeah. different designs for EV tolls, but there's four major ones. T- take us through them. Yeah, I think... I'll give you. I'll give you a handful of them. Multicopter is one of them, uh, a type of design where you'll see almost like helicopter propellers, but a number of them a- across the sort of aircraft. Um, so they're great for taking off and landing, much like a like a helicopter vertically. But they're really not efficient at long distances. Um, so that's one style. You've got the lift and cruise design. Um, this combines this multicopter approach with more of a sort of traditional aircraft um, approach. Again, good for the up and down, um, but also good for longer distances. Um, you've got this, what's known as a ducted vector thrust, and one of the companies that uses this kind of system is Lilium, which you know, I'll talk about, visited their, their sites a couple of times over the past couple of years. Um, they use multiple individually controlled electric, duct- electric ducted fans um, that push the vehicle upwards, basically. Like, so these fans sort of like a hover, hovering. Sort yep, of like a hovering. So great for great for hovering. They're quieter. They can fly long distances. They can go uh, take off and land vertically. So these, I mean, those are some of the sort of there's many, many more, as you said, kind of technologies um, as well. There's the tilt rotor is is another one which has, as the name suggests, these sort of rotors, these almost propellers that that are on a tilt to help it kind of go forward and, and back uh, as well and up and down. So there's all these different systems. Being Some of those bent. designs are actually already in use for, I think, military helicopters. I think the, that one is the tilt one, rotor. The tilt yeah. rotor, yeah, yeah. The, um, there might be some listeners, including myself, who might be thinking... A vehicle, flying vehicle, which takes us short distances. Um, I think there might be one in existence. It's called a helicopter. Uh, so, why do we need these when we have helicopters already? I think there's a number of reasons. One, the the safety record of helicopters has been called into question a number of times. Um, you know, versus versus airplanes. Um, the fact that they're not electric. Uh, And, you know, we're trying to move towards a greener and more sustainable world. So that's another thing in in favor of this. Um, Helicopters are noisy, very noisy um, versus some of these these aircraft. Um, But also the price point of helicopters. They're inaccessible mainly to to you and I, you know, we, we can't just sort of rock up. And and the the way that a lot of these companies are are positioning these these um, these sort of uh, EV tolls is They'll run a kind of Uber system, almost, uh, a sort of ride-hailing system. Obviously, they're not going to come to your you know, house, but you'll go to, and we can talk about that, 
what might be known as a sort of micro airport or a verti port, you'll go there. But effectively, you could book an app. And the idea is there's going to be a fleet of these run by an operator. Um, and they should generally be quite affordable to run. But premium still comparative to... Premium still comparative to... Yeah. to so like your Uber Lux, but maybe a step up from that. Yeah. If we were sort of Still comparing. slightly premium, but the price point will, will look to come down. And it, and, it, and it's looking, you know, I mean, we live in London, right? It's uh, And I'm sure many of our listeners live in other cities where traffic's bad. Traffic is bad. Mm. I mean, we're thankful in London to have a very good public transport network, which helps. You know, you can certainly get to a lot of places in the city quicker on a train than you can on in a car, um, that's for sure, or even sometimes walking. But um, there are many cities where that's not the case. Public transport isn't there, infrastructure isn't there, cars are heavily relied on, the traffic's bad. You know, Think about this now, you take that out of the equation, you fly above the traffic. That's another a point uh, that, that is in favour of, of why um, people are investing so much in the EV toll. When you say investing so much, where are we at when we talk about sort of the market situation and these early stages of this industry? Millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars have been invested. A lot of VC, venture capital money has gone into these companies. Um, you know, just just a few of them. You've got Lilium. They're based in Germany. You've got Ehang. They're out of China. Uh, they've been around for a while as well. Um, even Airbus, you know, big Airbus, the company that makes the big jets, even they're investing in this space. Archer Aviation, Joe, the list goes on. There's a number of names, and a lot of them, a lot of the startups have, um, <clears throat> a lot of the startups have got VC money um, backing them because they feel this is a big area. Now, let's be honest, um, it's a bit of a gold rush at this point, and not all these companies are going to survive, have viable business models, their technology won't win out. But that's, I think, the stage we're at right now. There's a lot of investment going in because of the promise of the technology. And we see that in so many areas, right? Electric vehicles and in various other areas. Um, and that's where we're at right now. Infrastructure, non-existent. Doesn't yeah. exist. Well, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. But before we get to that, just on the growth element, 2021 report from Morgan Stanley predicted the market for EV tolls uh, will be worth $1 trillion by 2040 and $9 trillion by 2050. Nine trillion dollars. I mean, that's yeah. that's a lot. That, that is a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot. And the business models. I mean, what what makes up that nine trillion dollars? You've got the companies that are making the aircrafts uh, and selling those. There's that, and then you've got all the bits around that, right? What about the you know. You have airlines these days, right? You have all the airlines in the world, and they buy the planes from Airbus and Boeing, right? Um, I think you'll see a similar model. You have you have airlines to some extent, uh, whatever they might look like in the future, running these fleets of air mobility vehicles, urban air mobility vehicles, EV tolls. I think that's how that will work. So you know they'll charge a they'll charge a fee. They'll have to buy the hardware and then there's all the servicing that comes all the companies that service and then you know what hap- what what i mean what what do these things look like in the future well exactly yeah. i think i think the designs are still to be determined or what's the most effective yeah. um well, you talked a little bit about infrastructure yeah. uh, and i'd also like to talk about regulations because yeah. today if you wanted to take a helicopter ride mm. over a major city is going to cost you a lot of money and you don't see it often because it's very difficult to do and the the airspace is limited. So something's drastically going to have to change to accommodate essentially hundreds of these EV tolls flying around above our heads. Yeah, there's no there's no infrastructure. I uh you, you alluded to uh this feature program we've got coming out looking at the future of these these flying cars basically and these these EV tolls. Um as part of that I went to Munich um, to visit a company called Lilium, uh, went to their headquarters. Their production facility is huge, so th- there's infrastructure there happening. They have this this huge w- multiple hangars where they're testing, and so there's infrastructure in the sense of the company's building the product is that's happening. And and um, actually, in 2022, I went to the south of Spain where they had a testing site. So there's some testing sites around the world um, happening. One of those for Lilium is in the south of Spain. You know, um, Ehang which is a Chinese uh, company that, that makes these passenger drones. Um, they have a testing site in Guangzhou where I used to live. Um, that was interesting. I visited that as well. I, I mean, that was before anything was happening in Europe. They were well ahead of the game. They were test flights, all sorts. So that infrastructure is there. The next step is how do you then 
go from, yes, you can build them, yes, you can sell them, to how do I get from A to B? Uh, and what where, where are these like? things going to land? What was fascinating about Ehung was they were, they were taking these off into the sky from what was effectively a shopping mall. Like, like a car park or above a it shopping was a mall. Small, it was a small area of a shopping mall. There was a strip of, of restaurants, right. um, this outdoor area. Okay. There was an office, a big office building. And right next door, they were doing test flights. So I think that was great because it showed you actually how little space you need um, to do it. These things aren't as big, uh, don't have necessarily the wingspan of a helicopter. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I mean, some of them do. Yeah. I think Lilliams was like 14 meters or something. Okay. It was huge. But, what, but you don't need the runway, no. right? You don't need a massive strip of land for these things to take off. They just go up. I think what's going to happen is you're going to see these, whatever new modern style of helipad, micro airport, vertiport, they call them, effectively, you know, from one, from A to B. Um, so there might be one, let's say you're in London, uh, there might be one, you know, in the center of the city somewhere that takes you to, I don't know, Heathrow Airport or one of the big airports, or maybe there's, a, there's one pad here in, in London and the other one's in another city, say Birmingham, um, you know, and that might be, uh, you know, point to point, just as you have a train station point to point but these things need to be a lot smaller they're just a little area of land so the key is going to be what these look like just on the regulation front yeah i mean these companies surely have to sort of have that in the front of their minds because why would they continue pumping all this money in if if someone's never going to allow you know hundreds of flying vehicles in the air or at, at any one time so do we know kind of where we're at? Are like the early discussions on that? What's been, I think, really interesting about this area is the regulators have been quite on board with it all. Really? Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll go through some of the sort of yeah. major jurisdictions that are trying to make big movements of this. You know, China, the Civil Aviation Administration of China, they've actually given a what they call a type certification um, to one of Ehang's vehicles. I think it's a two-seater passenger vehicle. So they can actually now carry out if they want to commercial operations. Wow. Yeah. Um, Subscribe to the Squawkbox Europe Express podcast. Join Steve, Karen, and myself, Arabile, in unscripted and dynamic debate around the day's top stories with first and exclusive interviews of the best in business and global newsmakers, original points of view, and instant analysis of the latest business news and key market themes. Get set for the day ahead. Squawkbox Europe Express podcast, now available on Spotify, Apple Music, and Google Podcasts. Very interesting, as I said, we, I was telling you about the shopping center mm-hmm. experience, takeoff and landing. So the, the U.S. Um, Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, they also have a program for certifications as well. So they've, they've, they've set out clear guidelines. This is what you need for us to, to feel comfortable to operate these. So in their view, um, they've got things like the aircraft need to pass a certain number of certifications. The pilots need to be certified too, right? Uh, And they believe operations can be at scale at one or more sites by 2028. It's not a long way off. You don't often see regulators sort of give a timeline to to kind of say, you know, we're going to, we want these in operation by then. They're they're quite forthcoming. Is that, is that, is that because they're trying to just be the leaders in a new tech tech industry? Essentially, you know, it's, well, it's an aerospace industry, but with a lot of tech in yeah, there. Yeah, I think so. I think so, partly to be the leaders, but also we the benefits. You can there's a lot of tech we talk about, hmm, do we need it? Mm. You know, but actually this could be quite game changing, really, if you think about it. Think about the way we travel. Time cutting down, better for the environment. Um you know I, I had a conversation once with I think it was my dad, but anyway, he said, Imagine, you know, an alien came from another planet. Yeah. And look to our oh, the way we travel, and they can see us on roads driving in vehicles going really fast right past each other, and you know when there's all this space and they go, you're crazy. Like why are you limiting yourself to these roads yeah. <laughs> and these tra- You know, and it, rather than just going where you want to go, if you think like that, then it it kind of makes sense. And what how we have been traveling, maybe it's not the best way for us to get around no i don't think it's not the best way to get around uh, i mean using that airspace i from a practical perspective i would 
I flew one of these aircraft myself mm. in virtual reality. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Yeah, in virtual reality. Very recently. So I was there and uh, I was uh, piloting one of these aircrafts over London. I was like, this is great. So was it just a joystick? Yeah, I had my headset on, my virtual reality. But headset. as in... You're... Yeah, well, no, I had like two joy, like, you know, the... The up and the, the up forward. and down, yeah. Up and down and forward. Yeah, you back. know, I'm not like forward an aerospace backwards. expert, but yeah, it was up and down. Yeah. For go, stop. Stop, midair. Hover. 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 Oh, very yeah. Good. yeah. Just ho- just hovering over the River Thames and looking around and spotted the London Eye, Big Ben, uh, flew past CNBC's offices. Um, but that's quite nice. I just land on the roof. So it was just, easy to operate? Just qu- Yeah. I'm sure they've simplified it. Right. But I think actually also it is. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Because that would be my next question is, who's going to fly these? Uh, you know, obviously, if there are like a taxi sort of operation, then yeah. you're going to get a license. But are you going to need a helicopter license and a pilot's, you know, an airplane I think there'll be license? special licenses. You know, the, the, the US Aviation Administration has already said that there's going to be special pilot licenses So required. unique to the EVTOL. Unique to, yeah. So there's going to be a lot of that. I mean, you know, I don't know how lucrative this is going to be in terms of would you know a pilot give up their airline job mm. to to fly these or or could you and I well, train? I, I imagine they'd be super excited that you know new forms of employment are yeah. opening up because pilots seemingly seem are losing their jobs and and again we go on to autonomous aircraft yeah. because to me having a pilot in there seems redundant particularly as you know we move towards a world where planes commercial planes it's not unfeasible to think that they could be pilotless but but the pilots have to be in there right now i think that you know that pilotless is I, I, when i was speaking to the ceo of lilium on that trip i said you know what about autonomy he's like nah not right now not right now we need to get these in the sky we need to prove they're safe we need to prove the viability of them to the public autonomy is down the line it can be done but he goes, not right off the bat. So I think autonomy is going to be a stretch. I mean, it's the same thing as autonomous cars, right? Um, we're looking at them now. We've been talking about them for ages, mm-hmm. but we're no closer to having them out on a mass scale. Well, in China they are. But uh, we're, no, we're no closer to really having them out on a mass scale because... Well, they have, we've had some incidents. Yeah. And while some... the tech's there, yeah, it's that the regulators need to be... This needs to be watertight. Even these with the pilots need to be watertight. Well that I mean the safety element is got to be is going to be paramount. When we talk about aircraft safety in commercial aircraft the the safety protocols checks are extensive. Hence why we it's very rare to have uh, an accident on a commercial aircraft. Very rare. Private aircraft slightly more uh, uh risky. But still, there's safety checks. But these are happening. You know, that's also why, you know, it costs so much because there's so many people involved in checking every time a plane lands, going over over the plane, checking all the settings, checking that, you know, everything's in working order. And if eVTOLs are a several flights a day, are we going to have those safety checks happening? And that, again, is going to ramp up the cost because you're going to need people to do that. You know, these things are going to need to be on the ground to be then rechecked. There's a lot. Yeah, there's all those practical considerations, I think, that aren't necessarily being spoken about right now. I think um, then maybe there'll be less safety checks than aeroplanes. I'm not sure. They're, they, you know, large jets have so many different parts to them, right? Um, these almost feel, or at least they're being marketed as you kind of step in, mm. off you go. You know, pretty easy. Because, you know, you talk about cars, right? If yeah. you have an engine failure in a car, you pull it over to the side of the road. If you have an engine failure yeah. in an EV toll, it's uh, going to be slightly more And serious. that's why some of these models are talking about individually controlled fans or propellers. So that if one fails... Yeah. Right. They use this term redundancy. So if one fails, you've got backups. And it would take a lot of them to fail to bring the aircraft right. down. Um and so there's all of those. I mean, the the other thing is this is one giant computer basically flying in the sky. Um, so there there does bring that element of risk in into it. You know, if computers can fail, uh, but then on the flip side, they can also be monitored remotely. And so there's all of that too. You know, to 
the safety element is just going to be so key. Um, and, and will the public go on it? Well, that uh, you're leading into beautiful. Well, I'm asking you. Would, yeah, you. would you go on it? Well, I, I think I would. Um, obviously, at a price that was I see, felt right, but right now it feels like it would be still the preserve of the uber wealthy. Um, so yeah, I, but I, if it became something like a you know that we have a ferry that goes down the River Thames, yeah. Uber Clipper, uh, yeah, yeah, you know it's a it's more expensive. It's probably the most expensive public transport you can take, yeah. um, but you know you take it once in a while and yeah. it's a nice experience. But it's not outrageous. You know what? That's the, where I sort of see it. Yeah, I praised London Transport earlier because I think it is very good. Mm, um, agreed. The transport around the rest of the country, however, is. Uh, lacking Mm -hmm. I feel like it's so expensive to get a train in the UK I wonder you know given given that how much the cost of these this say I wanted to go from I don't know you get London to another city to maybe Birmingham to Manchester which actually some of these EV tolls can do that distance and that makes sense right because it could be quicker um and you just you just kind of sit in this aircraft for 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 a short amount of time and, and you're there rather than sort of going in to like a train station and then, you know, getting on a train and going all that way. Um, you know, those journeys these days are really expensive. So I wonder how much sort of an EV toll would cost in comparison because it could bring some competition to the train, to the train operators. Because if their pricing, if the train operator is already so expensive and these EV toll operators are going to be pricing, you know, on the premium end, but maybe that looks very similar to a train ticket, um, you know, you'd, you'd opt for the, the veto maybe but that 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 may be where it's most effective and most practical as well yeah. because actually if you think about going to a location within the city to then go to another location but you've got to get to the vertiport get on the yeah. the you know you're waiting for a few other people to get into your ev toll and then land and and the checks and and whatnot yeah. actually it might be quicker just to take the tube yeah um, but your, to your point, actually, between cities, those are the journeys which, you know, it could be much yeah, more yeah. practical. I can't imagine the point of them flying around a city like London, for example, or even some of the other European cities mm-hmm. where there's public transport networks in place. I, I can't see the point of it. While, whilst I was in virtual reality flying over London, um, I was thinking, like, realistically, there's tall buildings here, there's tall monuments. How are you going to operate something like this at scale? across this airspace whilst london is like a sprawling you know and large city it's still quite tight it's still quite packed even up in the skies there's a lot more skyscrapers going up these days um so i'll be interested to see whether in the future what takes off is the is the use really about that longer distance that currently we might drive to over three two two to four hundred miles or or uh, or take a train or is it actually within cities and uh, i feel like for me, what makes most sense now, and I, I guess it's going to depend country by country as well on their infrastructure. But for me, in the UK, for sure, it's about it's about those city to city journeys. I know that one analyst called it the mother of all aerospace bubbles. Yeah, uh, which I think you quote on the uh, on the program. Uh, is that is that a rare dissenting voice in this, or are there a lot of uh, people questioning the viability of this? I think. Aero, the, the the mother of all aerospace bubbles, I think, is, is true in the sense that there's a lot of companies doing this. A lot, a lot, a lot. And as I mentioned earlier, not all are going to survive. There will be collapses. There will be consolidation. There will be just failures. Uh, companies that just don't quite make it, who have maybe raised you know millions of dollars of money. Um, that is where we're at right now. But that is... That happens all the time with these these cycles, right? We've seen it already in electric vehicles. Um, you know, every company trying to raise money and, and some have already collapsed, not quite made it. Um, we see it in AI right now. Bubbles, bubbles, bubbles forming. Companies raising money. But that's what happens with tech cycles. When there's some hype around a technology, you often see it, um, see a lot of money invested. You know, uh, venture capitalists and others betting on who's going to, Who's going to win? Who's going to win out? But it would be very difficult for all of these companies to survive that have raised money. And so there will be collapses in that sense. But in terms of as we think through the technology and as we think through the, the use, I feel like during this discussion, it, it's become clear that, you know, there will be a market for it, but that just needs to be figured out. And there's so many hurdles here. And I know like 
we're talking about certificate certifications being handed out and companies doing test flights and everything. But one is one issue with this, with any aircraft, right? This thing could get grounded to a halt. And then secondly, you know, it's public acceptance, isn't it? It's would you get on one? Would you feel safe getting on one? Even if, you know, you've got all the safety checks and stuff, are you going to be an early adopter? Are you not? Are you going to wait a few years, see how this pans out? There's all of those questions uh, as well. The price point, is this going to be reserved for the super wealthy? Um, all of those things. So I think just to, yeah, rightfully throw some some sort of balance and skepticism around the growth of EV tolls, there were a lot of limiting factors and potentials that I see that could pop up at any moment. Um, that could, you know, really slow down the growth of the industry. Um, and so whilst it's very exciting, whilst um, it would be cool to have, uh, I think there's a lot of things that need to be worked out, one from infrastructure to safety to regulation to then public acceptance and people saying, you know what, I feel safe enough to jump on one. Before we finish, just wanted to flag the, the history of flying cars or, you know, the 1940s, 1950s, I thought it was sort of amazing that the US had their their own uh, secret program trying to develop these. It looked like a flying saucer. So I'm sure the conspiracy theorists were, were loving that. <laughs> um, and also, we can't finish this episode about flying cars or EV tolls without talking about Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the, yeah. the OG. The OG, yeah. And obviously, you know, a close um, affinity with yeah. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That's your nickname, isn't it? Uh, it was for a time. For a time. Uh, for a time. I'm, I'll try and bring that back, actually. Yeah. That would be nice. It's nice musical, I think. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a classic. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we finish the episode, we have, of course, got to do stat of the week, which is thirty-five point eight billion US dollars. Tom, thirty-five point eight billion dollars. The market value of EV tolls in twenty thirty. Close twenty thirty two. We've got it. The EV toll market size twenty thirty two. Well, actually, this you're right. Year. Yeah, I know. So so random. You're right though. You're right. We're gonna. I'm gonna uh, give you a point for that. That's, a half mark. Yeah. No, just take the full credit. You basically got it. Uh, you know. Uh, okay, I've got a stat of the week for you. Okay. How much money do you think it costs to take the fifteen minute journey in a helicopter, private helicopter, yeah. from Battersea? In central London, yeah, to Heathrow Airport. That's central London. Uh, in 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 pounds. In pounds. In pounds. Yes. Um, we'll have to figure out a conversion to uh, hire a six seater helicopter. A six seater helicopter. That's like a military helicopter, isn't it? Wow. Um, six seater helicopter, Battersea to Heathrow, uh, three hundred and fifty pounds. Two thousand pounds. No, just over two thousand. No. Yes. That is forty wild. miles. There you go. Wow. But you wouldn't have That's to almost t- the same price as the uh, underground here. No. <laughs> <laughs> I joke. I just, that was clearly a joke. Um, yeah, no, that's, that, that's very surprising. Well, I've really enjoyed that. And I'm sure our listeners have. And if you have any questions on EV tolls or you just want to give your opinions on, on this burgeoning industry, then please email us at beyondthevalley at cnbc.com. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you, Tom. We'll be back next week for another episode of Beyond the Valley. Goodbye. Beyond the Family.